There we go. Hi, I'm Matthew Steiner. Matt is a certified senior crime scene analyst. He's explained crime scene forensics in Technique Critique. So that's a really interesting yet very illegal way to get DNA from somebody. Today I'm going to show you how to analyze various bloodstain patterns. In this episode, we'll learn the techniques forensics experts use to investigate bloodstain patterns, ranging from easy to difficult. So normally when we go to a crime scene, it's not set up like this, unless we have some sort of Dexter-esque crime scene where the killer really planned it out. Today we're doing on set for safety purposes. For us at crime scenes, when we investigate them, safety is number one. We want to protect ourselves. Uh, there could be various bloodborne pathogens that we're dealing with. And secondly, we don't want to contaminate the crime scene. So we don't want the hairs and fibers on ourselves, the DNA that's shedding off us, falling onto our evidence. At a crime scene, we'd wear multiple layers of gloves if we're going to be handling evidence. And then we'd want to wear eye protection if there's like a splash hazard with blood that hasn't been dried. So our Tyvek suit covers most of our body, including our feet because we wouldn't want to be introducing our shoe wear impressions into a crime scene or destroying evidence that's there. So normally I'd be wearing a mask, but I don't think it's a really good look for talking on camera. Next, we're gonna talk about the three main categories of blood stains that we can encounter at a crime scene. Today, we're gonna to be using defibrinated sheep's blood. We have taken the fibrin out of this blood. Fibrin is a protein that's in our plasma that causes our blood to clot. So if we used regular whole blood that had the fibrin in it, we'd have a clotted mess inside this bottle. Bloodstain pattern analysts correlate the appearance of these bloodstain patterns at a crime scene to a mechanism by which they were created. It isn't a crystal ball. It isn't like the way TV presents it, where a crime scene investigator walks into a scene and could tell you every single action that happened inside that crime scene from beginning to end. Analysts can correlate the static bloodstains at a crime scene with dynamic forces that create them. So we look at is specific stain patterns, and we could figure out how they possibly were created. And then with that, we could show a small window of time. Not the whole crime, but that this type of force could have created this sort of pattern. So passive patterns are patterns that are created without any sort of outside external force other than gravity or contact. So we're gonna first start off with dropping blood at 90 degrees to see what we get. So I'm going to take a pipette and a small amount of blood and hold it directly above and drop it. So when our sphere of blood strikes a surface at 90 degrees, we have a very even, round circle at a crime scene. But also what affects the way our blood stain looks is the surface itself. We have plexiglass, and we notice that the edge characteristics of our blood stain are very even. Now that we observed the way that blood acts on a smooth surface, let's try tile, which has a little bit of texture to it. One drop of blood, straight down onto a different surface now. You could see a little bit of scalloping around the edges there. That's because of the surface texture. So the scalloping is just the different ways that we describe the edge characteristics of blood stains. So it could be smooth, uniform, it could be scalloped, or it could be spiny. So now we change our surface to a rougher surface, wood. So we can see a vast difference from where we started, where we have smooth edge characteristics. Now we have this spinier pattern because that blood drop is being disrupted by the surface itself. And we can also see we have some satellite stains. Satellite stains are stains that come off a of parent stain. So this main stain here is my parent stain. In this case, because of the disruption, they are being forced out from the center of it. We also see satellite spatter when blood is being dripped into blood. Typically at a crime scene, uh, especially with stabbings, we wanna look for these drip patterns. It could be that the suspect accidentally cuts themselves and they're moving around a crime scene and fleeing the crime scene and they could leave blood trails that we could follow. Next, we're gonna be looking at contact transfer stains. A transfer pattern is a passive pattern where we have a bloody surface coming in contact with another surface. And then sometimes we could actually figure out what made that transfer, whether it was a hand, or a weapon, or someone's clothing. I mean, that's the best type of evidence that we could have at a crime scene, because we have the victim's blood and we have the suspect's impression. There's very few explanations of how that happens. So we're gonna start off with a shoe wear impression in blood. So this could be our victim walking through blood, creating patterns in our crime scene, or this could be the suspect's shoe wear impression. We're gonna coat the bottom of the shoe and we're gonna transfer the pattern of the bottom of the shoe to our clean surface. Now I have my shoe wear that's completely coated in blood and then inside that crime scene, we have a transfer of that pattern. And we'll notice is that that pattern gets lighter and lighter as we move along. 
what we don't see with our naked eye, we could find later on with chemicals like luminol or blue star. So we could see a continuation of that pattern as someone walks away from a crime scene. Sometimes we see transfer patterns in textiles. So next we're gonna take some blood, saturate a portion of our genes with it, and we're gonna transfer that onto our surface. So sometimes in real crime scenes, these get misinterpreted as the lines of minutiae in your fingerprints or palm print. What we would see is that unlike fingerprints, they're just straight lines. Either way, we would document this and collect it and send it to the lab, and then under magnification, analyze it. So next we're gonna discuss how movement could affect these transfer stain patterns. So I'm gonna take some blood and put it onto my hand and then move that across the surface. So if I touch the surface and then move my hand, we see what's called feathering. The effect of movement on blood, just like if I took a paintbrush and moved it across a wall, you know, in the beginning it would be darker, but eventually it would get lighter. So this feathering effect helps us interpret movement at a crime scene. This could be found at a crime scene in many different ways. One could be a suspect has blood on their hands and they move it across a clean surface. And another very common way that we see these patterns at a crime scene are what's called drag marks. We have a victim that's bleeding and either they're moving through the scene or someone's dragging them through the scene. And we'd see the same effect, that feathering going towards the body. Next, we're gonna cover our flow patterns and that is the volume of blood being affected by gravity. So what we can see here is that gravity is pulling upon that blood and pulling it down on our surface. At crime scenes, this may be very valuable evidence when we observe our victim's injuries. A person had an injury to their shoulder. If they're standing or if their body is erect, that flow pattern should go straight down their arm. But if they've been moved or there's movement or that injury was caused when they were laying down, we'd see a different flow pattern. So next we're gonna discuss saturation and pooling patterns that we'd have at a crime scene. Saturation and pooling patterns could tell us that someone is bleeding in a certain part in a crime scene for a period of time. You know, sometimes when we see bubbles at a scene, that could mean that we have a expirated pattern or a pattern that's coming from an airway. But let's pop those because we don't want. But what this could tell me is that we had accumulation of blood there and that there has been no movement. Because if this happened and then we moved the shirt, we would see that the blood would move in that direction. Typically, we'll see this on mattresses or beds or bedding and then it would absorb a little more. So now we're gonna have an accumulation of blood on a non-porous surface, and we'll see pooling. So pooling and saturation, it's the same mechanism that we're looking at, just the accumulation of blood. But with pooling, the blood is not being absorbed into the surface. For pools of blood, what we'll see with actual whole blood that has fibrin in it, they will dry a lot slower than it would in something that's absorbent, but also what we're gonna see over a period of time is clotting inside that pool. And then sometimes we'll see affect what's called serum separation. So the edges of this will be clear where we see the plasma of the blood as it separates. So now we're moving on to the spatter category of bloodstain pattern analysis. With this category of bloodstains, we're looking at some sort of external force on an open source of blood. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put a small amount of blood on our wood here. I'm gonna strike it with a hammer. And what we should see is that impact spatter on the plexiglass in front of us. Put on my goggles. I'm gonna put my hood up. Give us a small amount of blood here. All right, ready? There we go. So as you can see, not only do we have impact spatter on the plexiglass in front of us, we also have it on our suspect here. Okay, so we applied force to an open source of blood and we have a resulting impact stain. Our stain pattern, what we'll notice is directly opposite where the force was applied, we have our blood striking that surface at 90 degrees. So these stains that we have right here near the bottom are circular, but the further we move away from that source, these blood stains are now hitting this surface at an angle. So our stains are more elliptical. Bludgeoning would be the most common way that we get these stains, but it could be that we have the force of a bullet passing through somebody. So we have a phenomenon called forward spatter and back spatter. So if someone is shot and a bullet passes through, say, their shoulder, we have blood going in the direction of the force or with the bullet out of the exit. But we also have blood going in the opposition of the force, and that's what we call back spatter. First off, we started by creating different patterns that we could analyze. Next step, we're gonna look at something a little more difficult. Next we do is calculate the area of convergence. That's a two-dimensional area on our surface. If we draw a line through the long axis of several stains, 
where all these lines will meet. They should converge in an area somewhere in the center here. What I want to do is pick several stains that are elliptical from different sides of the pattern. We're looking at this to solve where this blood came from. I'm going to start with this stain here, and I'm going to line up so that I'm drawing a line through the long axis of my stain. So this is where the tail is going to help me out to figure out the directionality, but also to line up my ruler. And then sometimes what we'll do is just kind of show for a jury an arrow the direction that stain was going. So then I'll move around the pattern from different sides of it and draw through different stains. Uh, so this isn't done at every crime scene, but when we have a pattern like this, we have elliptical stains along the outside and we have some circular stains towards the inside. Uh, this is the perfect opportunity for us to do some analysis. I could keep going and draw more lines through more stains and it should all be coming back to the same general direction. So if this was on the wall and this was very low, you know, this could be very powerful evidence to show that, you know, that that was low to the ground where this impact happened. Since we identified different stains that are striking our surface at different angles, we're gonna figure out the angle of impact that these stains hit our surface. We do that by measuring the length of the stain, we divide it into the width of the stain, and the arc sign of that number will give us our angle of impact. So we're measuring stains, we always wanna use millimeters, allows us for smaller measurements. So what we could also use is a digital caliper, and that will give us precise sub-millimeter measurements. So I want to measure the length of the stain, the long axis of the stain. So this is 3.1 millimeters. And then I'd measure the width of it. So I'm measuring the widest part of the stain. That's 1.7 millimeters. We're going to divide 3.1 into 1.7. So if we do the arc sine of that number, that will give us the angle of impact, which is 33.25. If you had a regular ruler, you would just have to round up to the closest millimeter. So in this case, this stain is four millimeters. And then we measure the width of it. It is two millimeters. So we would divide four into two, which gives us 0.5. And the arc sine of 0.5 is 30 degrees. And if we can see this, basically at the same distance from our center, but just on the other side. If we look at this two-dimensionally, we know that these lines of our area of convergence meet here. But if I want to think about it three-dimensionally, that my blood is coming from somewhere above it here. So the next step will be is that we're going to calculate the area of origin. If it's coming in at a right angle here, I have a triangle. So this will be my adjacent side of the triangle. I know that it's 90 degrees from here. So that's my right triangle. And then this side that the path takes is the hypotenuse of the triangle. And so if I know the distance from my stain to my area of convergence, and I want to figure out how far away my area of origin is here in space, if I do the tangent of that, I could figure out the side, like Sokotoa. When we analyze blood stains in a field, I always feel it's better to do all these methods we should be coming up with similar results, but if you messed up somewhere, you know, one of those is gonna be correct. Next up, we're gonna try something a little more difficult, interpreting relationships. There's an adage that forensic science is the art of observation governed by science. So we have observed our stain patterns at our crime scene, and we're gonna interpret how these possibly were created. So if I go to a crime scene, and I see that there's some clothing there. Eventually, I'm going to recover this. But after I recover it, and I see that there's passive stains underneath it, I know that this came after this, that this wasn't in place, that this was placed afterwards. And if I don't see a transfer of blood on here, it could be that this was already dry by the time this clothing went on top of it. So now we're looking at a passive drip pattern. Uh, this could be the victim's blood. This could be the suspect's blood. We won't know until we sample it and send it off for analysis. What we can interpret from this could be movement. So if this trail of blood is leading away from the scene, we would see those tails going in a direction of travel. Now we're looking at a white pattern. We have a pre-existing stain that something came in contact and moved through it. So we could see from our discussion earlier of feathering that the directionality is coming towards me. Something is passively dripping blood that could be a weapon, that could be a victim, that could be our suspect, and then something later on comes through it. 
That could be someone trying to clean up the stain. This could also be that maybe someone was dragged through this or there was some sort of movement through that stain. So that was a white pattern. Now we have a swipe pattern. Blood is on something here and we could see again that same feathering going in the direction of travel. We have a transfer pattern with movement, which is a swipe pattern. There's blood on something and then we're just moving that in a direction. Usually when it's a white pattern, we could see those original stains. So they're drying and then someone tries to wipe them off with a cloth. Now we're looking at a cast off pattern. So this is a subcategory of spatter. That's a projection mechanism. So blood is on an object and we're moving that object in space. That could be someone's hand, that could be a pipe, that could be a bat, that could be a knife. And as that object moves, blood will be flung off it. And we have these very distinct linear patterns or curvy linear patterns. At a crime scene, if we see these cast off patterns, they can go up the walls, they can go across the floor and even onto the ceiling. So we're looking at a spatter pattern, but we have a normally continuous drops of blood that are being interrupted or blocked by something. And that gives us a pattern what's called the void. Sometimes we have crime scenes where there's something important that would be in that pool or in that pattern or that spatter pattern and it's been removed. So it could be someone's bag or a cell phone, their wallet. I had a crime scene where someone was bludgeoned and adjacent to his head was the complete absence of a blood spatter. Looking to the left of him, there was a spatter pattern that didn't line up. What we determined was that the curtains inside of the hotel room were open at the time of the crime and then closed later on. We've gone over how these patterns are created, our different categories of patterns, and what we can interpret from these patterns at a crime scene. This is not a simple process. This stuff takes time, training, and experience. And beyond that, it, there's no absolutes with any of this. There's no one specific answer, then it's only that one answer. I hope you guys learned a lot.